The list of evidence for an ancient Earth goes on and on, and none of it is consistent with only a 6,000-year-old history, nor does it provide any support for a worldwide flood 4,300 years ago. But it gets worse when we look at the specific details of the Noah's Flood claim. Just some of the more serious problems include A handful of people somehow used Stone Age tools to build a large wooden ship in which to cram potentially millions of animals, along with their many specific dietary and other requirements for an entire year. That much cargo would have sunk the ship immediately. Not only that, but even with today's advanced tools and engineering, it would be impossible to build such a large wooden ship without it immediately breaking apart in rough floodwaters. Most animals would have had to travel immense distances to get to the ark, including many like termites, snails, sloths, koalas, and penguins that have limited mobility, or that can only tolerate a narrow range of conditions, or that have highly specialized diets. All of the many diseases and parasites specific to each species would have had to be carried by at least one of each animal. Tens of thousands of diseases affect humans alone. I wonder which of Noah's family members carried all the venereal diseases exclusive to humans. For nearly all existing fossils to have been created by the flood, right before the rain started falling, there had to have been an average of over 2,000 vertebrate species, ranging in size from tiny shrews to massive dinosaurs, for every acre of land on the planet. That's not even counting the more than 90% of species that are invertebrates. If the rain came from a vapor canopy, it would have had to be superheated. If it came from ice falling from orbit, it would have become superheated upon entering the atmosphere. Add to that the water coming from the fountains of the deep, as the Bible describes it, which from even just a mile down would be boiling hot, and there's easily enough heat to have vaporized the oceans and destroyed virtually all life on Earth. The seismic activity pulling the continents apart, forcing up mountain ranges, and causing nearly all the world's volcanoes to erupt at the same time would have poisoned the atmosphere, generated enough heat to vaporize the oceans, and once again destroyed virtually all life on Earth. The amount of sedimentation that would need to have been mixed into the water to account for all the sedimentary layers being laid down at once would kill virtually all marine life, and most of the remaining life would have died from the radical changes in water salinity. After the flood, the water covering the entire Earth's surface would have had to go somewhere, but there's no mechanism for getting rid of anywhere near that much water. After spending a year in cramped quarters without exercise, the animals would have had to travel up to many thousands of miles across inhospitable terrain and vast oceans to reach their natural habitats. This includes all the animals that move extremely slowly or can only survive in limited environments. Almost no land plants or their seeds can survive immersion in water for a year, so after the flood the land would have been barren, providing no food or habitats for the newly released animals and just eight Stone Age humans would have had to repopulate their former lands across the world, reviving all the lost languages, writing, religions, professions, technologies, and other unique societal developments of their former cultures, without showing any interruptions to their historical records, nor mentioning anything about a global flood at all. And those eight people would have had to reproduce so incredibly rapidly that in just 150 years, fewer than eight generations, they would have had enough people to build Stonehenge, the pyramids, and numerous cities mentioned in the Bible, as well as populate all of Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Indus Valley, China, and the Americas with millions of people. All this while experiencing war, disease, and global famine during a migration across the entire planet. Even using a global growth rate twice as fast as the most rapid ever recorded in human history, there would be fewer than 5,000 people in the entire world in those 150 years, which is nowhere near the millions of people required to match even the most conservative historical estimates. The realization that the Ark described in the Bible would be orders of magnitude too small to fit millions of species and their supplies, even if only young, small specimens were brought on board, has caused many creationists to conclude that new species can evolve after all, at least up to a point. They defined the biblical kind at the genus or even family level in an attempt to bring the number of species on board the ark from millions down into the thousands. 
The idea is that there was a single cat kind, a single antelope kind, a single beetle kind, a single two-legged carnivorous dinosaur kind, and so on. And that after leaving the Ark, they rapidly evolved into multiple species to account for the tens of millions of species seen both in the fossil record and alive today. But for that to work, all the surviving animals would need to have evolved at a massively accelerated rate right after the flood. Just to give one example, the basic cat kind would have had to evolve into lions, tigers, leopards, snow leopards, cheetahs, caracals, mountain lions, wildcats, lynxes, bobcats, jaguars, jaguarundis, ocelots, servals, saber-tooth cats, domestic cats, and the rest of the 13 cat genera, 40 cat species and hundreds of subspecies, and do it quickly enough to show up as mummified remains, artwork, and written historical records all within a few hundred years of the flood. Ironically, that pace of evolution is far faster than evolutionary theory predicts. Not only that, but before splitting into multiple species, each kind would have first had to breed up to thousands of groups to then send to all their new environments, some of which were many thousands of miles away. Only then could they have evolved into the tens of millions of species that exist today and in the fossil record. And all this supercharged evolution would have had to happen within a few hundred years, only to then abruptly slow way down to the pace we see today. So why isn't there any historical or other evidence of tens of millions of animal groups suddenly appearing, migrating all over the globe, and then temporarily evolving at an incredible rate into a huge variety of new species? Clearly, there are some serious problems with this limited evolution creationism. But other creationists insist that life cannot evolve beyond the species level, despite the problem of trying to fit many millions of animals onto Noah's Ark. They also claim that there have been no observed instances of species evolving into other species. The primary definition of a species is a population capable of producing fertile offspring, and once you have a genetically isolated population, all it takes is time and continued selective pressure to result in a whole new branch on the evolutionary tree. So, do we have any examples of new, successful breeding populations that can no longer breed with their original populations? Well, evolution is generally a slow process, taking an average of a million years and thousands of generations of environmental pressure to create a new species that persists. Nevertheless, we do have some good examples of observed evolution. Humans have actually participated in the process over many thousands of years through what is known as artificial selection. It's the same process as natural selection, only with humans rather than natural environmental pressures determining which traits will survive and spread throughout a population. We've bred dogs, cows, sheep, pigs, turkeys, pigeons, etc. that are genetically distinct from their wild ancestors. We've taken advantage of unique mutations and crossbreeding to evolve the species of grass into corn, a tiny wild fruit into large tomatoes, a seed-filled green fruit into long yellow bananas, and so on. We evolved a single wild plant into domestic cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and kohlrabi. In the lab, researchers have used controlled environments to put intense selective pressure on bacteria and fruit flies, causing them to speciate rapidly. A single species of bacteria can be made to evolve into multiple distinct species within a few hundred generations, and fruit flies can evolve into a new species within just 25 generations. But what about observed speciation in the wild? While the process of studying the evolution of new species in nature is of course more difficult than with artificial selection, there are still many observed instances of populations undergoing speciation. For example, European mice introduced to volcanic islands west of Gibraltar in 1419 evolved into six genetically distinct populations over the course of 500 years. Three species of wildflower that were imported to the U.S. from Europe just 100 years ago evolved into two species of American goat's beards. Nylon, which was invented in 1935, is a substance so artificial that nothing was able to consume it, but within 40 years a new species of bacteria was discovered that it acquired a mutation allowing it to digest nylon. And in 1981, researchers observed the breeding of two different finch species in the Galapagos Islands, which resulted in a new hybrid species that remains a successful breeding population today. 
So clearly both the artificial and natural observed evidence doesn't support those creationists who claim new species cannot evolve.